I would like to introduce Mike Hutchins. He is the Extension Dairy Specialist with the University of Illinois and is going to talk to us today about strategies to troubleshoot dairy rations. And I explained to him that we have often very high forage diets in Vermont, so I think he's going to have that angle to some extent. So welcome, Mike. Thank you for taking time with us today. Our theme on today's webinar discussion is going to be strategies with the 2016 forage crop, some of the thumb rules, some of the guidelines, some interpretation as it applies to our beef and dairy producers. So certainly uh, one of the underlying theme right now, certainly in Vermont, as it is in Illinois, and that is the, the whole economic situation in the livestock sector, especially with dairy cattle. We're looking at fairly modestly low milk prices right now, so we're getting squeezed pretty hard. So the question is, how can we try to uh, respond in, into these economic opportunities? You can see here's a picture of myself with a with a uh, uh, artificial 100-pound bill. I'm not sure that's legal in Vermont. It's not very legal in Illinois, but uh, printing your own money might be one solution with the dairy scenario. Certainly, I'm not going to walk all our, our our listeners through this whole list. Uh, Daniel has all these PowerPoints if you're interested, but certainly it's a changing environment. Uh, had we had this webinar a year ago, we all would have been smiling and happy because we would have seen much, much better milk prices. Uh, you, you can scan down through here. Not only are milk prices low, but so cull cow prices have dropped as well. The valuable calves have dropped down a little bit. And the sad part is that we in Vermont or we in Illinois can't do much about it. A lot of it has to do with uh, the strong U.S. dollar, exports, um, increased milk yields here in Europe. Uh, and New Zealand, uh, so certainly a challenging time, but yet let's take a look to see how forages maybe can solve some of those dilemmas. Uh, we look at the feed situation, at least here in the Midwest, we have lots of low quality hay and haylage. Uh, in fact, uh, it's uncharacteristically widespread. Uh, high quality hay right now is about $230 a ton for high quality hay. We'll define that here in just a few minutes versus low quality hay, which obviously is going to be slightly over $100 a ton. The good news is there's lots of low quality hay. The bad news is it won't support high milk production. If you use a thumb rule, what's a RF, RF, RFV, a relative uh, uh, RFV? relative uh, forage quality, and then that should be an F instead of a V. Yeah, that's a good typo, Mike. Anyway, if you look at $240 a ton for high quality alfalfa or alfalfa legume grass mix with a 180 RFQ, there it is, uh, that ends up being $1.33 a point. And had we had this webinar uh, six months ago, that would have been much closer to maybe a dollar as far as that goes. And in the Midwest, soybean meal is cheaper than fuzzy cotton seed. Probably not a lot of fuzzy cotton seed being fed in Vermont, but a lot of it here in the Midwest. So, it, so the feed situation has really done some interesting tumbling around from time to time. So what I want to spend the next 45 minutes on is looking at trying to find some bottlenecks or de-bottlenecking any forage blocks you have out there. And by a forage block, it simply means there's a restriction in the forage feeding program that restricts, obviously, milk production. And the bottom line is that you and I lose money. And so the question is, can we find some of these and get down to the bottom part so we move that bottleneck so we get the production that we have genetically bred into our cattle and we have management on our farm and facilities and get that job done. I thought I should talk to a very uh, important person in Vermont nowadays. Uh, we see him on TV a great deal, and here's your senator. And so you can see here I am trying, and you can see he is holding up his fingers. And what that means, you're going to get two pounds more milk by attending this webinar today. So that's the good news. Just write that down. Your cows will give you two pounds more milk because you came to this webinar today. And we move on. That's supposed to be funny. Anyway, not a lot of humor in the Republican group. We move on. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to talk about what I call the pillars of feeding in 2016. Some opportunities I'd like to share with you in Vermont that are working here in Illinois as well. And of course, the bottom line is we're always going to be remaining on focus on profitability. Can you make that adjustment, that change? Does that mean dollars for you? Why are we using pillars? And I like the, the image of pillar because it says support, undergirding. It maintains stability. And that's exactly what the forage program does for us. Uh, we, we look at, at, at these high forage diets, and Daniel has given me some neat insight here. Certainly as we see higher and higher diets going to higher forage diets. And here is a hit list that comes from Dr. Larry Chase. Some of you will recognize that colleague of mine from Cornell. And so here are all the neat things that what a high forage diet can do for us. And if you're a dairy nutritionist, you like the fourth one. Usually it means healthier rumens. Cows have fewer digestive 
problems as far as that goes. The good news is uh, that you control this on your farm. That's good news and bad news. Good news, forages are controlled on the farm as far as quantity and quality. The bad news is if it's low quality, now we got a serious problem out there in the feeding program. I think we're going to see more forages also in Vermont and Illinois because of the last point, and that is that basically as we see a bigger and bigger world population, we're going to get off of the human plate. And, and so obviously not, of, not many of us are sitting down each day to eat a plate full of grass or legume or corn silage as far as that goes. But certainly if we've got corn and soya in our diets, obviously we can make those into human foods and, and uh, survive as well. So certainly increased forage intake and certainly quality is going to be a factor. So you're going to see these pillars pop up each time. And I guess, Daniel, I will stop and we see a pillar and see if there are any questions. So you're going to see several of these pop up in today's program, and I'll let you and your people in if there's a question or concern or clarification we need to do. So <clears throat> I started out with some, some uh, uh, the pillars are, are pretty much all Daniel's fault. So if you don't like this webinar, it's all his fault. It's certainly not my fault. We're going to look at the forage test. And, I, and just stay with me because I think there's some very important things to look at. And, and, and this is what my dairymen say, Mike, there's got to be something useful on this sheet. Look, I, I've got hundreds, not hundreds, but tens and tens of numbers here. What, what does it all mean? And so we're just going to walk you through this using a hay and haylage uh, type uh, a scenario here, one of our testing labs. So you're going to see kind of an interesting approach here, and we're off and running. The first one is, is pretty straightforward. You're going to see uh, just three numbers that are somewhat important. Now, this happens to be a, a haylage mixed. Uh, example comes from Dairyland Labs, which would be similar to Dairy One or Cumberland Valley. You have your labs out there on the East Coast. This is one of our major Midwest labs here in, in, in located in Wisconsin, as you can see from the address. First of all, the important things, look at that pH down there. Folks, and that pH on good grass silage, alfalfa silage, we'd like that below 4.5. So this pH sits a little on the high side. Now remember that here as we go through this discussion a little bit later on. And you can see it's a little bit on the dry side. Uh, we're not sure if this is coming out of a bag or a bunker or where it's coming from, but it's a bit dry at this point, sitting at 67%, uh, excuse me, 47% dry matter. So certainly that becomes a, a factor as well. So that's important. That pH means what? Stability and fermentation control when you ensile that crop. But we move on. Question. Yes. Um, no. I don't look at as many forage tests as dairy farmers do, but I'm just wondering, the, the, the ones that I do see from Haylage, I don't often see them down there at 4.6, I often see them in the fives. Is that your experience, Tom, in your... Yeah, that, that would scare me, to be very honest with you. Why does it scare me? Because you may see higher levels of butyric acid, less stable feed, not quite the palatability that we'd find with a little higher uh, fermented uh, acid uh, feed. So uh, I expect to see them around 4.5. Corn silage, for those of you that are listening, and we aren't going to go through corn silage today. That's another topic for another day. That would be about a 3.6, 3, 3.8. 3, so I don't know, Danny, do you see your corn silage? Is that low on pH? Corn silage, we get good fermentation. I think um, I remember somebody saying it's really hard to mess up corn silage as far as getting fermentation to happen. But the uh, uh, haylage, I, I often see those in the fives. Does the increased dry matter uh, typically, if you have more dry matter, is your pH going to be higher? Uh, basically, th th this, uh, no, I'm going to back up. And it does back up. Generally, when I see a high, uh, a pH that's high, I usually expect to see wet silages. So I think you're going to be out of the sweet spot, meaning the, 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 the optimal place to be. If the silage gets below about 35% dry matter, about 45 or 50, then again, look out. And normally, I would expect the pH to be high on both of them. First of all, if it's over five, Daniel, and if it's fairly dry, that means that it, was, it probably was too dry to ferment properly. If it's really wet, then we get more of a butyric acid, more of what I would call a sauerkraut type fermentation going on. So uh, our, our, our silages should be sitting right in that four to four five. That's right. That's where I'd like to see them. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Anytime. Jump right in as we go through this. Now here is a whole gut number. Now you're going to see what's going to happen here. Now these are all protein numbers. And so when I look at a result, I'm going to click again and notice what I got left are in dark 
dark black. And uh, my colleague did this for me. So to me, crude protein is important. Now, folks, as you're sitting here, watch this one. This is 2015 data from Wisconsin, not Vermont. So you can see this one, the protein is pretty high, almost 22.5 or 22.6% 20 protein. The average was 20, and look at the range over there. So it gives you a nice feel. So not only do we get a test result, but it gives you a little idea of what's normal in your area there. Notice the solubility on this one. This is modestly high. Nearly 60% of the protein is soluble. That means the, the rumen have, bacteria have to capture this and convert that over to microbial protein. If they don't, you're going to see high levels of uh, nitrogen in the urine. And if you're a dairy farmer, you're going to see milk urea nitrogen. And that's a tremendously useful tool, we think, in evaluating how well you are capturing nitrogen in the feeding program. And so you can see this one is modestly high. It's one of the highest ones there. Uh, ammonia, uh, the other one, notice there, this is very important. Ammonia as percent of crude protein, this should be under 10%. And so if you get it over 10%, then evil things can happen, being uh, the, the, the butyric acid, the clostridial type fermentation. So again, you can see this one at least high in soluble protein, but low in ammonia. And that's a little surprising, Daniel and, and listeners, because normally those two numbers go together. But again, uh, useful numbers on protein. Then we move on to look at this one. Look at all. Pardon? If you have high levels of ammonia, high levels of soluble protein, and you just know that for whatever reason, that's the nature of a lot of the stored feed that you have. And I think that can happen here depending on the conditions. Um, I'm wondering, is, I know we'll get into this later, but would you look at that test and say, oh, I need to, I need to modify the, the, the nature of the carbohydrates going in there to mop that up um, at a you know, more instantaneous type of uh, rate? Yeah, that, that's correct, Daniel. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're seeing all the soluble protein, and let me back up again. Uh, we'll back up here. If you see all the soluble protein, then the question is, can I adjust the ration to soak that up? Now, here in the Illinois, the answer probably would not be very favorable in Vermont. That is, let's put some more corn silage in there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move out some of the soluble protein by feeding less of this haylage and more corn silage so my rumen has a source of energy, the starch coming from the corn silage and the fiber from the corn silage and reduce the amount of soluble protein coming in because uh, I just can't capture it all. In fact, the bottom line in Illinois is two-thirds corn silage, dry matter base for my forage program for dairy cows, and one-third coming from my grasses and my legumes. And therefore, I can manipulate and manage nitrogen much more effectively as far as that goes. So if this is my only silage on the farm this this grass legume uh, silage on the sheet here I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be in the urine business I'm going to have lots of nitrogen going out in the urine and I expect my muns to be probably in that 14 15 uh, milligrams per deciliter range as far as that goes okay Okay, we'll move on. Uh, here comes all my fibers. And again, uh, all of these, if you're a nutritionist, they all make sense. And we click one more time and look at all the ranges. So again, some of you may want to print these out because this is a whole nutrition talk right here. It says, how good are your forages? And so what you do is print this off and write all your numbers in to see where you fit on average versus and where you fit in the normal range. So I'm clicking one more and I'm going to go to these four. As a dairy nutritionist, these are the big four that I look at. Acid detergent fiber, ADF. This reflects digestibility. And you can see that this one is in good shape. You can see it's about 32%. The average is 32. Some of you would have heard this thumb rule on, a high, on a alfalfa called the 20, 30, 40 rule. 20 protein and dry matter base, 30 ADF, 40 NDF. And you can see this one fits that one pretty nicely as far as that goes. So, so one, one thing that, um, I don't know, one of the kind of rules of thumb that you'll hear uh, people in the forage uh, arena talk about here is if, because we, given that we have grass and the ADF is a bit higher uh, than the alfalfa uh, crop, that the rule of thumb generally is if you're half done with your first cut by the time you're at 50% NDF, you've done a pretty good job. Um, so you might, what, what can you say about the difference in those fiber levels and the difference in the adjustability between the alfalfa and the grass? And yeah, Daniel, you're not going to like my thumb rule, but remember, I got Illinois numbers here. If I had to make this grass, I'd be looking at probably 35 ADF, 
uh, 45 to 50 NDF as being my target, and the protein are probably going to be somewhere in the teens. So I would probably add about, uh, and my, my thumb rule, and I'm writing it right down here, I'd probably go, to be honest with you, I'd probably go 35 and 45, that's ADF, NDF, and the protein is a big question mark, but probably is going to be someplace in that, in that uh, 15 to 17% crude protein. I, I think if you hit those, you're really going to have some good numbers. Now, notice the third one down, NDF digestibility at 30 hours. That's the key. That's the key. In other words, you can see this one is 45%. It means of the cell wall, of the fiber, 45% of it is broken down. On average, you'd like to see this number around 47, and look at your range over here. And, and again, I think my cursor will appear out there. This is straw-like over here, and this one means this is really, this is almost as good as maize silage or corn silage. So this, this is a real powerful one. So not only do we know what percent, if this is 45 or 50 percent, the question is how much of that is now digested? And then so your variety, your maturity, your growing conditions, all those are going to play games with you in terms in Vermont as it does here in Illinois. So again, that's a powerful. So if there's only one thing you learn in this next, in my presentation is take a look at the NDF D30. What does that 30 mean? It's 30 hours in the digestive tract. So it says, in the digestive tract of dairy cows, about 45% of this grass alfalfa legume mix is going to break down, and it's below average. It's below average for, uh, for, for, for where, we, where we'd want to be. I'd like that number to be up. up as you can see somewhere around 47 to 50. The higher, the better. And of course, the BMR, the brown midrib corn silage, those numbers really jump up because that's what it's bred for, and that is because it's low in lignin. Some of your folks in Vermont are going to look at low lignin alfalfa. It's coming in the marketplace this year. And again, if you got low lignin alfalfa, this number here, this NDF 30, will go up by about five or six units. That's huge. That's huge as far as that goes as well. So. so the, Mike, I want to mention um, one of the things that I've noticed in uh, taking some of the forage samples is that the, even among the grasses, there's a pretty big difference among species. And I know the companies are even trying to differentiate themselves on different varieties of the grasses uh, on the digestibility of that fiber. So there's been, you know, with the Italian ryegrass and tall fescue, perennial ryegrass, those are very different. They typically have a very different NDF D uh, than. Um, say an orchard grass or maybe a canary grass. Yeah, amen, amen. And, and Daniel, you know more about that than I do. But again, th that's why you'll see this on corn silage a little bit later on. We're going to look at BMR versus leafy versus waxy versus stacked. And the answer is, yeah, they're different. And the corn companies have done a yeoman's job, and they're gonna, the grass people are coming right on as well. The grass people and the alfalfa people are kind of, uh, kind of behind the eight ball because they said, well, we don't have a lot of excitement, but now they got low lignin. And they're going to have low soluble protein. That's in a, that one's probably three years away. They're going to use tannins to lock up some of the protein. That tannin is found by in in, in plant material primarily to protect the crop from bugs, but it can also uh, has some impact on room and fermentation as well. So there we go. If some of you are wondering, so we talked about the 30, that's the hour. So you'll see these other numbers down here. These are hours. A stands for amylase tested. So the amylase means there's no starch contamination. So if you see an A in front of this NDF, that means that it's been treated with an enzyme or the NIR was trained to see it so that you do not see this contamination with it. And then, of course, you'll see down here this one that's in gray right here. That means ash has been removed. More about that in just a few minutes. The ash, organic, so it means no starch and no ash. So uh, that's what this number is. Uh, what's the uh, NDF 30 uh, sampling error and lab error? Uh, generally, are you uh, saying that those are all accurate? Or That's my question. Well, I think I understood his question. It sounded like he's asked, what about lab air and, and sampling air? Sampling air is always a problem. And that's why we recommend that you test your forages probably at least monthly. And if you're a bigger herd, even more frequently than that, because you're going to do an average, because you're right. Uh, the sampling air is always going to be a bit of a problem. So if you average, Bill Weiss argues, if you average five or six samples from a given bag, 
or a bunker or whatever or silo, wherever you're coming from, that probably reflects as true of a value that you have there. The lab analysis are pretty accurate, but stay in the same lab. So don't be jumping around from lab A to lab B to lab C because their NDF 30 number, NDF D30 numbers will vary because it depends on how they grind it and what their equations are and what kind of sampling that they, that they had coming in there when they established their equation. So whoever asks that question, you get a you get another cup of coffee or a glass of milk because you are right. Though are those are risks, but we just accept those risks. I mean that, or you don't you don't test at all, and then the answer is now you're just shooting in the dark as far as that goes. Now the other term on the bottom, which I'm not sure how much time, Daniel, because we don't want to run you real late here today. This is UNDF uh, UNDF 240 hours. This is kind of a new fiber value because it determines array of passage and uh, fill factor and also using modeling. So it determines how fast do the fibers go. So you can see here we got it at 240. That's 10 days after the cow ate the feed, 120 hours, and here we're sitting at 30 hours. So you can see on, on this example here, we could say uh, whatever goes before 30 hours is faster fiber than it goes after 30 hours. So you can see the difference here, that this is going to be a much slower fiber. This one is gonna be even, even much slower as far as that goes. So you can look at the difference here, and now remember, be careful, this is percent of ND of dry matter. These are percent NDF, so listeners, be careful, be careful, be careful. The These labs, I don't know why they're doing it, but they are doing it. They're reporting it this way for NDFD, and this way for UNDF. UNDF stands for undigestible, neutral detergent fiber and it's coming very very quickly we're going to show you an example on that in just a minute okay we're going to move on jump in though if you got a question don't don't be hesitant here comes some carbohydrate numbers uh here comes uh, uh here's what you're going to find and the number i like to watch is sugar this is water soluble carbohydrate or sugar and it says this is a silage just as low now this was hey you guys are grass and slush grass this number can get quite high daniel you probably see numbers what as high as seven or eight percent up there in Vermont, if you've got some of this lush pasture growing out there, these high sugar contents? I, I typically look at non-structural carbohydrates as a whole number. I, I, I can't hold numbers, you know, I think maybe four or five on the sugar. So okay. Non-structural in the 20s. Yeah, now remember, the, the, the sugar in, in, in the silage, is uh, the bacteria are going to convert that down, break it down to volatile fatty acids, you'll see here in just a minute. But th this is one reason why some of our silages don't ferment very well is we don't have a lot of this and that's why Daniel said nobody can goof up corn silage because most corn silage is going to have 25 or 30 percent starch in it and of course those bacteria take that some of that starch convert that over to volatile fatty acids so you can see on a sugar content this one is modestly low uh, for some reason uh, versus what the average would be in the normal range I can't explain that to you uh, although the fermentation was fairly light in looking at the at the pH of, of that silage. So we move on. Now if there's this corn silage, starch would be would be huge. Here comes all your minerals, the useful information. The one that I like to zero in on is potassium. You agronomists can look at that because it may reflect a little bit of your fertility in your soil. But if you got dry cows, close-up dry cows, the potassium can really bugger up the, the decat. So that's why I like to watch potassium in my dry cow program. You can see this one's very normal, very normal. Look at the range we have here, as high as 4% as far as that goes. The new numbers coming out from Bill Weiss at Ohio State is potassium levels a little bit higher than 0.9%, more like 1.2 to 1.4% potassium, and their heat stress even higher numbers. So higher numbers for dry milking cows, good, good, good. For dry cows, close-up cows, bad news. And of course, all these minerals are important because we balance for those in the feeding program. Here comes your VFAs, your volatile fatty acids. And again, we're going to click on one more PowerPoint. And I like all three of these. Now, look at this one down here. This is butyric acid. And Wisconsin researchers say when this goes over 0.5, Look out, you got a bad silage. You got a risk of all this butyric acid, lower palatability, poor fermentation, high pH. And so this number matches, Daniel and listeners, the pH we saw earlier. 
being somewhat concerning. This would be a very good number, as you can see. And of course, this butyric acid, besides its effects on forage preservation, always forms ketone bodies in dairy cows, which can have some small impact on ketosis. So that's a smoking gun. Lactic acid level, as you can see, is pretty normal for haloges and acetic acid. A corn size just never will be up over 5%, and the acetic acid can be as high as 1%. And if you use lactobacillus buchneri, that's a new side inoculant that's on the marketplace from Lalaman and Pioneer, then this number can be high as 2%. This is what preserves silage as it comes out of the silo so that the yeast cannot grow. And what because if yeast grow, the yeast grow and they utilize the lactic acid, which shifts the pH around and allows molds to develop, and that can lead to all kinds of problems. So that's the beauty of Buchneri, Lactobacillus Buchneri, that's a specific strain of Lactobacillus organism found in certain sides and inoculants, and it increases lactic acid content up to a higher level. If you see a high level here, I've seen some where they're one to one. That's bad news. That means that acetic acid reflects a poor fermentation. So these boy, guys and gals, maybe that's all we get accomplished today. These forest test results is your report card. And it tells me a little bit about species, maturity, growing conditions, fermentation profiles. Did you use an inoculant? Did you use the right inoculant? All these things add up in terms of what these numbers look like on this sheet of paper. Now, I think we have one more, and then we'll, so we'll be through our first pillar, believe it or not. And here are all the calculated numbers, and you're saying, holy smokers, look at all those energy numbers. There's six or seven of them. Which one? And you know what? Our lab puts all these out. This is the actual lab result. And so they're not going to try to be the good guy and pick out which one's right, which one's wrong. But, of course, the beauty of today's webinar is I did. I did. And so here we go. The number I want for energy for lactating dairy cows is right here. Net energy, 3x means three times maintenance. That'd be a cow giving 60, 65 pounds of milk. A dry cow is what? Right here. This is a dry cow right there, 1x. That's a dry cow. This is a lactating cow. This is from the Ohio State Agricultural Research uh, Group. This is Bill Weiss's summative equation. We think it is the best equation on the sheet. So I'm going to use this number. These are mcals per 100 pounds, or if you want to go to per pound, it would be 0.57. So you can see on this example here, that number would be a, a fairly good number. Uh, above average. Now, notice we don't have a lot of uh, values on this screen here. We're going to come back and talk about this one. This one is really important for corn silage and alfalfa. This looks at milk per ton using equation from the University of Wisconsin in 2006 called milk 2006. And this says that this forage, based on its, and you'll see how it's calculated in a minute here, is about 3,000 pounds of, uh, per, per, per ton of dry matter coming from that field. That's a good number. That's a good number. Daniel was talking about non-NFCs, non-fiber carbohydrates, sugar, starches, uh, uh, pectins, those kind of things. And again, you can see this is a pretty good number. Daniel said your numbers are in the low 20s. This, 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 this would be a good number. So yeah, if, I think if you do, if you manage uh, your cutting schedule really well, you can get the, you can get the NFCs over, over 30. Okay. But yeah, this is good stuff. Okay, now the other number, should I stay in the black one? Is it easier for you to see if I stay in the black one? Or should I? I don't think we were, we were seeing, so yeah. Okay, so again, I, the number I want is this number right here. This is a useful num number, again, to reflect how much sugars and starches you have. I'd rather know how much sugar and starch you have rather than let the computer, because NFC includes organic acids, uh, pectins, uh, sugars and starches, so you're kind of, kind of, kind of a blanket type number. It's still useful. Now, here's the one you want for your grasses and legumes. RFQ, relative forage quality. This is based off of NDF digestibility, and this one is 150. That's a great number for grass. It's just above average for alfalfa. The old number was RFV, and that was driven by basically ADF and um, and, and NDF. So this is the newer, and these are calculations come from the University of Wisconsin. This number, my pointer, can, Daniel, can you see my pointer? Yep. Okay, so this is the one you really want to watch for legume and grasses. This one you really want to watch for corn silage. Really watch this one for corn silage, milk 2006. And then for energy, this is what you can put in your computer for dairy cows. This is the number you put in for dairy cows. For dry cows, you'd actually go back and, uh, and, and use this number down here. This is net energy for maintenance. 
and this is what you'd use for dry cow. So you can see how these numbers jump around depending on which cow and which diet you're formulating for. Okay, here is that equation that we use for the milking, uh, for the, the factors, the inputs in terms of the Wisconsin Milk 2006 equation. Folks, just get used to this. This is a very powerful tool that's used by most, not all, but most seed corn companies. And it's based on just what Daniel talked about. Non-fiber carbohydrates should be over 30. Starch levels and corn should be over 30. And the digestibility of that starch, NDFD, dry matter intake, the energy level, and the moisture content and process of all these numbers into the equation, and that's how they determine these two numbers. Pounds of milk per ton, which means that's a quality index. Your BMR corn size always wins on that one. Pounds per acre, that includes the quantity and the quality, and that's your BMR loses in most of the Midwest studies, is because we have a yield drag of 10 or 12 percent. And so if you're looking for quality, you use this number, but if you're looking, and this is the number I like, I like pounds of milk per acre. Now, why don't they have that on the test sheet? Because the lab has no idea what your yield was in uh, Vermont. So they, there's no way they can fill it that. But you, but the, the lab cannot. So they're going to give you this number right here, which is the quality index. And then you multiply quality times the tonnage, and bingo, you got it. So this, even I, even I can figure this out, and I don't even need a computer. I can just do it with my hand calculator over the piece of paper. Well, okay, that's pillar number one. I guess we had some good discussion. Daniel, are, does your folks have any questions that came in online or uh, in, your, in, your, in your meeting there? Okay, anybody who has questions online, go ahead and type them into the uh, chat. You can go to the bottom of your screen and you can see a little, little bubble there. Click on that if you have any questions and I'll try to keep my eye on that. But any questions from people in the room? Um, yeah. Yep. In terms of uh, relative forage quality, is fresh grass rather than better? So I, I, that gets to the question of how much do you lose between the time you cut it and between the time it, you know you, you put it up as hay or hay. Yeah. yeah. What's what do you know about that? Well, I, I can't help you on your grass much, but if my memory is right, and that scares me a little bit because I'm getting old, Wisconsin researchers fund this or legume in the field, and the time you get it in the bale or in the bunker, 15 or 20 units can be lost. Of course, that depends on, 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 on harvest conditions and rain and all that kind of good stuff, but I would suggest uh, the grass will be less because you don't have quite as much leaf shatter. So in other words, if your target is to get an RF, uh, RFQ on your grasses of 140, for example, which would be a very good number, by the way, then you'd have to cut, you know, at least when it's 150, because you're going to lose, and probably, my estimation on grass, 10 units, and maybe 15 or 20 on, on the alfalfa. All right, what about time that you actually <clears throat> cut the grass? Morning versus afternoon, because you know that the sugar content is higher later in the day than it is. Early. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I heard the question, Dan. It's a great question, very controversial here in the Midwest. What about that sugar content? The highest sugar content will be late afternoon. Uh, so that we know that. That's, that's, that's known. Now, the problem is, Don Understander argues that, that once you cut that plant, the plant is now cut off from the roots. It'll still stay alive. So it'll still respire. And I smile here, you can't see that, because when we cut alfalfa, you know, in, in my farm in Wisconsin, you knew you were cutting alfalfa because all night you had this wonderful smell. If the wind wasn't blowing, you could smell this alfalfa literally, literally respiring out there as well. Until you get down to about 50%, roughly 45 or 50% dry matter, the plant continues to live, therefore utilizing those sugars that you stored under the sunlight. And so some people would argue you should go ahead and cut that grass or that alfalfa after the dew is over and try to get it dry down as quickly as you can to hit that, to have it, to have it literally, last better word, carefully said die, to actually have the plant die, have it stop respiring, have the somatas close up and, 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 and not lose any more dry matter. And, and, and so there, there's an argument out here. I've seen agronomists go both ways on this one here. Our, our, our point would be is watch the weather and cut it. And, and if it looks like you've got the window, and, our, and here silage is here in, in Illinois, is uh, silage in a day. So it says if it looks like we're going to have good weather for the next 24 hours, I would cut it this morning at 9 o'clock when the dew is off. And maybe by 4.30 or 5 o'clock, it's ready to roll going into a bag or a bunker. 
as far as that goes. And yes, the sugar content won't be quite as high, but remember those bacteria in the, in the silage are gonna break part of that down, but that's also a food resource. So really, Daniel, I didn't answer his question. I, I think it's a lot of politics. Mine, I would cut it earlier. And I would try to get it to dry down so that in fact, when the sun goes down, that we're at least at a 45% uh, uh, moisture or, or less and, and, and shut down the respirer so that for the next night, for the next 12 hours, that plant isn't trying to, uh, to, to, uh, to respire and, and utilize the, the carbohydrates there. Yeah. What would I tell people? At, my recollection is that alfalfa research where the AM versus PM kind of first came out, I think some of that was done in Utah. And I think they can probably get some decent wilting, even if they do cut it in the afternoon. Here, if you cut it in the afternoon, it's really not going to wilt much. Before, you know, it's it's going to stay alive all night. So that's my concern. Yep. Is just getting that dark respiration, especially if it's a warm night. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah. So thanks. You bet. Okay. Uh, hearing no more questions, we're going to move on to uh, pillar number two, and hopefully I don't break up too badly. You're going to see me skip some PowerPoints because uh, I want to make sure we get to uh, get, get to what I think are the, the key points. So just stay with me. And, and Daniel has all of these, and he's a smart guy. He can he can uh, comment on those as well. So here we go on forage quality. I just put this up. This is a this is a Midwest summary. You can look at that at your leisure. You can see this is what happened in 2015, and this is a five-year average, which means pretty average year when it comes to legume and grasses. 20,000 samples here, 141,000 samples there. Nothing very exciting to look at except for this one down here. Take a look at that. That really is bad news. We lost about four points or three points here, and it starts out being a low number to start with. So that's bad news. If there's a bad news number, this is a bad news number here. And you can see also the NDF digestibility. It's also bad news. So uh, doink, uh, doink, that's a Wisconsin term, meaning bad news. Uh, doink on NDF digestibility at 30 hours. RFQ is bad news. Uh, the fiber is modestly high for us at, at this point, and the ADF would be high, assuming there's not much grass. Now, if this is all grass, it's a home run. It's a home run here, but grasses, grasses should be higher on NDF D30 than legumes, and that's because it has grasses that have less lignin in them. And of course, this would be a very good RFQ if it's grass. So don't want to confuse you, but <clears throat> this grass alfalfa thing becomes a very important factor, especially for you folks in the New England area because you do grow more grasses than we do in the Midwest. I'm going to skip these. Our USDA forage quality guidelines gives you a little idea what alfalfa looks like, and I'm not going to walk you through it because we just want to take that time. Here comes your USDA grass guidelines. Notice again, it's just protein. They didn't put fibers on. I don't know what the problem is at USDA, but that the protein to me is, is on a forage test, the protein is, is second tier. The most important thing is NDF, NDF digestibility, and RFQ. To me, that's the home run, and that's the numbers you folks in Vermont and we in Illinois should be looking at. Here are my grass numbers for a home run, and uh, the alfalfa one did get uh, got lost someplace. Anyway, this is grass. Now, if it was alfalfa, this is 150. I want to be over 130 for grass, 150 for alfalfa. These numbers don't change very much. Alfalfa, maybe a, a click or two up from there. So you can see, if I don't have over 130 RFQ, then I've got low-producing dry cow and heifer feed on the farm. It's not going to work very well with these current uh, feed costs and milk production. Uh, boy, you're going to get squeezed. So the farmer who has good quality forages this year, he's got a little bit of a chance, or she's got a little bit of a chance to survive uh, for profitability out there in the program. Now, this is one thing Daniel asked me to show to you. This comes from the University of Wisconsin. This is the last data set that was pulled together by Joe Lauer. Lauer. Joe Lauer is our agronomist, and here you can see these different hybrids. And then you have to, here's BMR, brown midrib, low lignin. And sure enough, look at this, milk 2000, and this is the 2000 number, uh, they're going to update that. The, 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 you can see uh, the value per ton of dry matter, $4, $409. It's, it's the winner. So if you look at the quality index, it beats high oil, BT, leafy, waxy, and all hybrid. It just is the winner. Now you come over here and look at yield per acre, and now you can see that BMR loses loses over here and loses by quite a bit. You can see the difference here is about uh, almost 500 pounds, $500. 
So it's huge. And of course, who's the winner? Here's your stacked, here's your stacked hybrids. This would, uh, BT uh, would be your, your European corn borer. You also have root, uh, root rod uh, stacking coming on here. And, and, and now you're gonna start seeing some fungicide stacking ones coming as well. So certainly your hybrid, much what Dan said earlier about your grasses, your corn silages, it makes a difference on it, where you go. And seed corn companies have values for them. Some of them won't give you these numbers, uh, and this should be on a perfect world 2006. We don't have that data. Couldn't find it. It's got to be someplace in Wisconsin, but I don't have it here in Illinois. But the point is it does make does make a difference. Okay. Daniel, we're going to go to pillar number three. Uh, is there any questions on a very brief discussion on differences on, um, on uh, forage quality? And yeah, there's a question about the different corn varieties, the different traits. If you want to back up one slide just for a second. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay. Between BT, Leafy, and all hybrids, really there is no statistical difference, is there? Did they run stats on that, or is that is that kind of how it panned out uh, just numerically? Uh, I'm not sure I heard the question well, uh, Daniel. <clears throat> well, the, I guess the question was whether whether the data that you looked at indicated any statistical difference in the BMR versus uh, some of the other ones in terms of uh, dollars per ton, or if those are just numerical differences that they really didn't do that. Uh, yeah, they, they didn't do that. And I don't think there's any easy way to do it because they go to about nine different experiment stations and collect this data. Some of the BMRs wouldn't be in all the experiment stations. So there is no statistical analysis on it. So you're, whoever asked that question, give, give him another cup of coffee or her another cup of coffee because they're really on top of this thing. But uh, statistically or not, there is no BMR being planted, very little being planted in Illinois. We just have too big of a yield drag. I talked to a colleague in Pennsylvania, and they said BMR is not very popular because it has all kinds of fungicide challenges. You're going to have to spray for fungicide because it's pretty wide open for any type of diseases coming down the pike in Pennsylvania. So, you know, the bottom line here in Illinois is uh, there are some newer hybrids coming out with both Pioneer and by Microgen. Uh, if you're going to try that in Vermont, I would try it on 10 or 20 percent of the acreage. Put it in a specific bag or silo or structure so that you can uh, test it and feed it to your cows and let your cows vote. seeing a 10 to 12 percent yield drag. And the bottom line is the economics just kill us. And, and so the third column, this column over here on economics, while it has not been statistically compared, our farmers tell me it's real. It's real. Daniel, any comments on, on uh, BMR corn silage in Vermont? Yeah, well, I guess what I'd say is that, um, you know, there are some, from what I hear, there are some real, uh, some varieties where there is significant yield drag and some others that are, that are pretty good. Um, the, cha the challenge has been that some of the better ones are really longer day varieties, which uh, in many areas, especially in the northern part of Vermont, we have trouble growing. So I don't see huge amounts of BMR, but um, yeah, there's the stability. yeah, there are some guys doing it. And um, the, the variety, the, the one that was along the river where that it got hit so badly by northern Cornelius, like, was that a BMR? I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, so I, I think that there are some varieties that people like for a lot of reasons, but then the, fun, the fungus issue gets us, and uh, given the sort of the political, cultural climate here, uh, you have a little resistance to putting fungicides on. Yep. Okay, let's move on uh, to um, NDFD Energy, and, and again, we're going we're gonna to do some surfing here because we're getting down to about 10 minutes to go. Uh, this is kind of a cool slide. It comes from Pioneer, actually, and it simply says we're really looking at this cell wall now. And so we're kind of picking up where, where, where your discussion left off. Here's your cell wall, and you can see it's made up of cellulose, lignin, and hemicellulose. And that lignin gives support. Now, our BMRs, you've got to check them from time to time. Some of our BMRs are not as low in lignin as we thought they should be. Normally, it's one half. Normally, our lignins are three to three and a half percent uh, in, in normal hybrids, and the BMR is 1.4, 1.5, 1.6. And that's why, of course, with a good 40 mile an hour wind like we had last week here, Illinois, if it was corn season, it'd be going down. It'd be going down. So, this has a tremendous impact 
on the cow in terms of how this cell wall is being developed. And in some situations, the lignification is not uniform, and the lignin may be found in the corners of the cell. And there's some plant breeders experimenting with that several years ago, haven't heard much about it. Obviously, if it surrounds the plant, if it's ling the digestibility of lignin is zero, then all the goodies, the sugars, the proteins, the starches, I can't get them. KKI meaning the bacteria or the enzymes in the lower digestive tract. So this is a picture of lignin. I'm not going to spend any time on it. It's a fun one to look at how it works and how it fills in there. Be well aware our dairy cows, our beef cows have both a physically effective NDF fiber that causes cud chewing, that causes the forage mass, and chemical NDF, which is something you get from the lab. And as a nutritionist, I need to solve both of those, and your forages address both of those. So if you have very high lignin, I got lots of this stuff. The problem is my cow can't eat enough of it, and of course the chemical test will pick up on that as well. We already covered this. You can look at this at your leisure, but the, the, this, 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 this forage NDF is a huge factor. Here are some values you saw a bit earlier. Why is that important? This is the power work out of Michigan State. For every one unit change in forage or total ration NDFD, that's about an extra quarter of a pound of intake, which is a half a pound of milk. So you can see if, if, if your grass is in Vermont or your rations that have grass in Vermont were 50 and you did a better job next year, it became 54, two pounds more milk, two pounds more milk because these cows now can eat more of that ration and therefore she translates that into milk production if she understands the research. So it simply says this NDFD is a huge, huge, huge number. So I have a quick question about that. <clears throat> so if we are able to put up some amazing uh, forages with ultra high NDFD, and that results in you know maybe faster passage rate. So you add something to slow that down. Do you lose any of that uh, milk because you slowed it down? Well, the, the uh, great question, Daniel. If, if that's your question, you, you two get a cup of coffee. The, the answer is yes and no. In other words, NDF digestibility is a lab test. And so it's assume everything is hunky-dory. Now, if this feed is going through too fast and your really lush pastures in Vermont could have that problem in, 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 in late spring and in early summer, then, then uh, while the NDFD chemical test looks good inside the cow, uh, it's going through so quickly that the manure score gets very, very loose and you start seeing cows that get very, very thin. And, and so it, to make this work, you may have to slow it, slow it up. And that's why some people say, okay, I'm going to put in a half a pound or a pound of straw to slow things down. My dairyman then said, well, Hutchins, dummy, why don't you just cut it a week later so it, it's perfect? And the answer is, if you promise me in Vermont, you can cut it uh, three days or four days later and it won't get rained on, you'll get it in, then you're right. But my answer is I'd rather have an NDFD that's too high and I'll let my, my nutritionist adjust for that by using some corn silage or some baled hay or some, uh, some grass or something of some, some other sort and slow it down. So the answer is yes, you have to be sure that the rate of passage is optimal so the calculated NDFD is true in, 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 in the digestive tract. Have I confused you? Nope, it makes sense. Okay. Yes, and, and so, so th there's all these political questions that come up and say, well, gee, Hutchins, uh, or, or gee, uh, uh, Hudson, you, you, you told us to cut it earlier, cut it earlier, and now you tell me to put a, a pound of straw in. By the way, uh, for Holsteins, once you get more than two pounds of straw, look out, look out, look, you're going to slow them down to the point now that I, they can't eat enough of it. So we're simply saying if you're going to try this straw thing, go in with a quarter, a half a pound, go for a week and watch two things watch milk yield, and watch manure score and see if you perceive some change there. Uh, of course, dry matter intake can be powerful, but most of my farmers can't get their hands around monitoring dry matter intake that accurately. Okay? Yep. Uh, th th this is a fun slide to look at. I think as you look ahead in Vermont, uh, here's grass size and grass. Hey, this comes from Dairyland Labs, and there's a winner. The, the loser is over here. Look how bad it can be. This is NDFD, and look how good it can be. Good grass can be better than BMR corn silage. And, and, and so what an opportunity. So the question is, as you are online today, where are you on this blue line? In other words, where are you down here? Where are you down here? This is, now watch this, this one is 48 hours. And you'll find, you'll find that in your test sheet as well. 
Why 48 hours? Because it's terminal fermentation. In other words, once you get beyond 48 hours, very little bit's going to break down anymore. You saw that a bit earlier as well. So the, the, this uh, powerful PowerPoint simply says, the, uh, what's the opportunity in Vermont? And the answer is it could be very good or it could really be very bad news out here in the program. And again, you can see the legume silage never, cha never, never challenges these two stories forage sources over here. What a fun slide uh, to look at and think about to say, where should my forage program be in 2016 and 17 and 18 in Vermont or in Illinois, depending on where you're living and where you're working. And so here's the graph of it. This shows that same data, a graph. Uh, you can see the number of samples here, almost 180,000 samples. And here sits alfalfa losing. Here sit your grasses, but look at, there's some big losers over here, but there's some big winners over here as well. Here sits BMR corn silage and brown, and it wins all the time. It wins all the time, remember? It always wins. It always wins. And here sits your oats, your rileage, uh, your, your wheat, wheat silage, those small grain ones. So again, this is a fun one to take a look at as well, looking at these various samples as well. Okay, now here's, here's a concept that you should be aware of because you say, I had this crook from Illinois talking to us. He never mentioned UNDF. And UNDF, undigestible NDF, determines room and fill and how much forage these cows can consume. For a Holstein cow, I'm going to use UNDF 30. That should be up here on the slide. My, slightly different than if it's 240. I'm going to use 6 to 6.2 pounds for Holsteins. For Jersey's 5 pounds. And so how does that work, you say? Okay, we come down here. I got a ration that's got 30% NDF. That's the chemical fiber. I, my cow, my Holstein cow, eat 15, 50 pounds of that every day, and it's 40% UNDF at, at 30 hours, which is a fairly good number. And it says, bingo, my cow should be able to eat six pounds and produce the amount of milk that's targeted with this ration here. There's my six pounds. So that ties this number to here and shows you how to calculate it. So now if, you, if your cows are only eating, uh, can't eat 50 pounds of dry matter, then you have to either get better quality forage by getting higher NDFDs or get, take some of that fiber out of the ration and use soy hulls or beet pulp or corn gluten feed or wheat mids or something like that to get that done. If we didn't talk about that today, then you'd say, where, where's that guy from Illinois I've been behind the door? Because th this is really becoming big in uh, New York and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin as far as uh, this fill factor. And of course, with these rumen modelers, they're going nuts on a deal like this because now they can look at fast carbs and slow carbs and fast fibers and low. So anyway, the, a company, I spoke with them last week and they are actually calculating this number, calculating this number for their dairy meat because they have all these numbers down here. And so farmers can track if they go from one bag to another bag or from one pit to another pit, they can actually see, do I have a greater dry matter intake potential because of the forage quality or does it really get, get hammered? And of course, fuzzy cotton seed works against this. So be honest with you, fuzzy cotton seed is not your friend over here because the, the, the fiber in, 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 in the, the cotton seed hull is, is pretty undigestible. Got a lot of scratch factors, and that's why you tend to see it used in some parts in the southern part of the United States to give you that straw effect, for lack of a better word. Okay, uh, and now we're going to pillar number four, and we're in pretty good shape. I got five minutes less, Daniel. Any questions on um, uh, NDFD, 30 hours, UNDF? Uh, it, it's pretty exciting technology, guys and gals. Well, this is <clears throat> there's a question that one of the um, people connecting from a remote location has. Um, they were wondering what uh, would be recom uh, your recommendation for new seeding on good soil that is well drained but can flood. And it's sort of a agronomy question that is also related to the forage. I, I think he's asking, what high high NDFD forage uh, would you would you look at there? And I guess I'll try to help answer this partly. I guess it depends on whether that flooded land often has ice sheeting. If, it, if you're getting a lot of winter kill because of ice sheeting, uh, that'll kill you know, a lot of those perennial grasses. You might consider no-tilling something with that. Yeah. Some years it doesn't matter if it's flooded or not. Right, right. So, but I, Ashley, actually, we've worked with him a little bit on the Italian ryegrass, so I might be tempted to say if, it, if you get a lot of winter kill every single year, you might just try no-tilling some of that Italian ryegrass. But if it doesn't get winter killed, uh, tall fescue 
in my experience, can can uh, take, you know, it can take some stress, but they've also done some breeding to keep the NDFD pretty high. Um, and that, might anybody else have a different opinion on that? Yeah. Okay. I think it's a great answer. I have nothing to add to it. It's a, a big time agronomy question. I, I don't dare tread into that area. Daniel, thank you very much for your comments and from your people there locally. That's very, very helpful as far as that goes. And we're gonna look at pillar number four. And this is the Lumen map. And that's kind of fun. This is actually a handful of TMR putting in a, in, a, in a bottle of water. I shook it up for my kids in class, left it sit for five minutes. See all that stuff floating? That is what your effective fiber is. So now you can actually see it. And here's this, some fuzzy cotton seed, a piece of corn silage up here. here. Here's what's floating. So this is what's gonna cause the cud chewing. And we need a certain amount of time for that. This is gonna get flushed out of the rumen. So you're kind of hoping your soybean meals down here and some of your corn grain because you want to get it out of the rumen so the small intestine can do their thing so the bacteria don't bugger it up for me out there in the feeding program. And so here are all different ways of measuring that. I thought I would show this technology to you. These are the rumen collars that is very uh, coming more popular here in the U.S. and in, in, in the Midwest. A collar, this uh, collar actually hears the rumination of the cow. You can also put it in an ear, ear tag and the ear tag will pick up the rumination by by the head movement and the, the, so the, this is new technology that's coming very very quickly will cost you about 40 or 50 dollars on top of normally these other id systems using for heat detection why is that exciting look what it does here is just a sample uh, example from europe and the blue line this is the rumination you can see the blue cow uh, the cows in blue are healthy cows the magic number from michigan state is 450 minutes so you can see this is two days after calving, four, day, four days after calving, these cows are now ruminating like they should. You can see if they have a DA, bingo, big problem, severe ketosis, down they go. So now not only do we have an opportunity, we can actually measure this thing and see uh, what, what's going on and does your grasses. So again, if this number stayed below 400, it is telling Daniel, put some straw in there or put some long hay in there, do something because it looks like we got to slow things down. We're not getting enough time. What a, a powerful tool. We're going to see more and more of this precision dairy coming in Vermont uh, as we are here in, in parts of the United States. In the meantime, you can use the Penn State box. You can see it pictured up here. Uh, this is the three box system. Uh, you can also go to the four box system. That is the data and these two boxes. Those are your functional long fiber. And so you can see in a TMR, the total ration, this should add up to over 50%. 50% of the feeds on a wet basis should be in these two boxes. This is what causes the cud chewing. So I need somewhere around 10% listed up here. Penn State will cheat you down to as low as seven or 8%. That makes us a little nervous. Here, so here is your TMR guidelines. Here is your haylage guidelines. Here is your corn processing guidelines with kernel processors set at a three quarter, three fourths inch theoretical length of chop and process properly. So again, a nice tool to say, do you chop it right? Or does your mixer, does your unloader have an impact on this physical form? If you've got the three box system as I have here, you just add these two numbers together. So I gave you the four box system. I like the three box system. I use that in the field all the time. But here you got, so this is another way if you can't afford that, those, those neck collars or rumination collars, that's another great tool that you can purchase from NASCO for about $250. And it's a, it's a pretty, pretty good device as far as that goes. I'm going to skip the kernel processing part of the talk, Daniel. We can always come back to it. But uh, to me, in Illinois, every dairy farmer that feeds corn silage must do a kernel, it must be kernel processed. And here's the data. You can look at that at your leisure. Uh, you'll see the processor. What you're trying to do is avoid all these kernels. This is the picture. And you can see if it's not processed properly, here sits the kernels. And after it comes out of the silo, there they still are. And you get to see them a third time yep, in the manure gonna come in the manure. So if you took this kernel and rubbed it between your fingers and it doesn't mush or break down, it's coming through in the manure and you lose that feed value as well. The guideline is if you took a 32 ounce plastic cup from McDonald's or Hardee's or wherever you buy a 32 ounce cup of something, if you've got more than one or two kernels in that cup, you didn't set your processor up properly in the feeding program. Now the good news is you can use this device, it's called a kernel 
processing score, KPS, determine how much starch goes through here. Uh, the, the Minor Institute is doing some unique work now, looking at the different levels on these different sieves as well. But here is the work from Wisconsin. It says that if you do a poor job of kernel processing, that is below 60. A kernel processing score below 60 is poor. Write that down. 60 to 70 would be adequate. Over 70 is excellent. Two pounds of milk from here to there, two more pounds of milk from there to there. So Dr. Shaver's data says that if you do it wrong, process the corn size, you're leaving four pounds of milk in the manure. That's really what we're doing. So we've got to get the processing right. And more about that uh, right now. Here's the test results. Uh, the, the test results from, uh, from uh, Cumberland Valley are a little bit better than Wisconsin. Here you can see 1,000 samples in 2014, and you can see 16% of our farmers got it wrong, 20% got it right. So there's four pounds lost here, two pounds lost here, and we've got all the milk over here. So the best score I've ever seen was an 84. I've seen an 84. Can you, uh, in your opinion, can you over-process or is that not possible from the starch perspective? No, no, from the, the great comment, Daniel, from the starch perspective, you cannot. I do not want to see any corn in my corn silage, even though it may have had 25 or 35 bushel corn, uh, I mean, a 25 or 30% starch in the corn silage analytically. I don't want to see the corn. I don't want to see it twice. Now, is that a, a more challenging corn to feed? Yes. You got to have the physical form there. So therefore, now all of a sudden, this functional fiber becomes an important factor. So a well-processed corn size sitting up here in, in the 70 to 80 range is a bit of more of a room and challenge, but at least I'm not feeding, I'm not feeding the, the pheasants or the turkeys. There's, there'll be no corn. There'll be no corn in the manure out there in the program. Now, as far as the physical form of the corn silage, that is set by the, the distance between your knife and your shear bar. In other words, what, or the speed, the speed of your drum, of, of your speed rollers. And I think that picture eh, is not going to pop up here. But so the answer is, if, you, you, if you're going to go to kernel processing and really hammer the starch, which you should, then you can link the chop. And we'll show you that picture here in just a minute since you asked that question. Okay? Thank you. So you got to get the length right. So Daniel, you know, if you ask that, whoever asked it, you've got two components here. The length of chop and then the starch processing. And my answer is you cannot over-process the starch. And that's why shredlage. Maybe you've, I don't know if anybody's heard of shredlage up there in Vermont, but it's a hot topic here in the Midwest, and shredlage just macerates the corn grain. And uh, here is corn. Here, here is a well-processed corn silage. Notice, there's your theoretical length of chop. The farmer said three quarters of an inch, and here's my ruler. And sure enough, it is three quarters of an inch. It's three quarters of an inch. It's three quarters of an inch. So there it is. This is perfect. Notice there's 13 percent of the top box. A plus. Here's my middle box. And you can see a little piece of corn here, a little piece of corn there, 70% in the middle box. And here's my bottom box. And here is the starch is going to be found here and other places as well. This sample had 34% starch in it. And you can't see. You can't see any corn. One farmer said, well, that's drought stress corn silage. Or this is from Vermont. It never matured. And the answer is, yes, it did. We just got it processed to the point that you can't see it out there in the feeding program. And so another test your farmers could do, and then we're going to wrap up here, and that's called the dairy fecal test, and where you take samples of 10 or 12 cows, put it in a pail, mix it up, and send a two-cup sample to your forage testing lab. Most of them will do that, and you want to be less than 5% in the manure. So again, there are some neat tests for forages. For corn silage, this is especially for corn silage, to determine if you're doing a good job. If you start seeing more than 5%, now again, you're leaving some milk in the manure. Now, this starch could come from barley, it could from dry corn, it could from high moisture corn, it could come from corn silage, any starch source. So you got to be a bit cautious because this couldn't be more than just corn silage problem, but certainly that's probably the one you want to look at. If you're here at 10%, then you will see starch in the manure. If you're over 10% fecal starch, you will see pieces of corn in the manure that are yellowish. And uh, that's a kind of a crude thumb rule, but certainly one to watch as far as that goes. This test will cost you about $17 or $18. The previous one, the kernel processing score, around $20. And you can see uh, this is uh, data from 2014, and again, based on some 900 samples that from, da from, from dairy cows or dairy farms. So again, some powerful, powerful tools. This is your kernel processor. Here's your shredlage unit. Yeah, they're, they're totally different, 
totally different concept in terms of crushing crushing the kernel as you can see here and away we go I do want to touch on these the question is how mature is your plan really going to be important for Vermont because you guys are challenged on this we are not in Vermont notice the red line when it's 28 the plant is 28 percent dry matter you got about 20 percent starch if you go to black layer and that's what it is up here it's over 40 percent so if you chop immature corn size or you you got a long day variety that you're talking about the BMR you can see the longer I can let that crop out there the higher the starch content is and the lower amounts of NDF and ADF in the feeding program huge concept huge concept and the kernel processors in Illinois allow us to go over here because now at this point the kernels are what like BBs, they're very, very hard. The kernel is mature, and we turn that processor on and macerate that kernel. So you can see, I probably don't need a kernel processor over here because the starch is very immature and the kernels are very, very soft, but you don't have much starch here. And so I want to get as much starch per acre as I can. And so we're gonna be telling our dairy to chop around 34, 35, 36, 37% dry matter and run dry matters, not milk lines. We're walking dry matters because some of these corn hybrids have stay green, which means the plant stays green and the cob, the, the cob is maturing. So we kind of left milk line now and went to the actual dry matter. And again, remember, if I'm getting over here, it's a little tougher to pack and a little tougher to ferment as well because now it's drier, much like we saw on the Haley sample a bit earlier. Uh, inventory control, uh, Daniel said this is important. You better believe it is. Uh, just three important things to look at. Make sure you have enough uh, inventory on the farm, especially if you're going to these high forage diets. And if it's high forage diets, it's got to be high quality because now you're hoping the forage carries the energy and the nutrients, the protein that you have to have. Holstein cows eat about 30 pounds of dry matter a day. And so if you want to figure out what your inventory is, if you've got 100 cows, that means you need to have about, about uh, a ton and a half of dry matter on your farm for those cows. Oh, you're going to raise your heifers too? Well, then add 30 to 40% on top of this number that you get here. This is a wishful thinking. If you've got 50 cows, it's a bummer. But separate quality and by bag. So first crop, second crop, third crop. Low lignin uh, corn silage in one bag, conventional corn silage in another bag. So, uh, you got to separate it and then know what's in each of those bags or in those bunkers. That's a bugger. Or in those upright silos. Yep, we may, might be able to do that with markers. And be well aware of what we call Christmas corn silage. And we won't show you the data here today, but it's Christmas corn silage is, is corn silage uh, is in storage for three to four months. The starch becomes much more accessible because the prolamine uh, protein breaks down and that is what's got the starch locked up and so you can either do that by fermenting that with high moisture corn or grinding it very very fine or leave it in corn silage so we're saying you should have enough corn silage on your farm in Vermont to get to Christmas and so you don't start feeding 2016 corn silage or excuse me 2000 we don't have any of that either 2015 corn silage until December of uh, or, in two, two, or January of 2016 and I think uh, we're done. Here are some things to look at already. We heard some nice discussion by Daniel about some of the new grasses. Uh, at least we think some of the, the fescue and some of the uh, tall fescues and some of the uh, the, the perennial, the, the dry grasses are there. This one's going to come here very quickly. You can treat straw and or, or, or corn stalks with calcium oxide to, dis to chemically destroy some of the fiber. You got to be careful on doing that. Uh, we mentioned there's going to be some new forages coming. And of course, bailage is here in the Midwest. Uh, our smaller farms love baleage. That means I can uh, wrap up these bales and put them in plastic and I can uh, feed them and feed them individually or track them on quality and go from there as well. So there's your take home messages. I am already uh, about 10 minutes over my lot of time. My apologies to you guys. Glad to have a chance to visit with you in Vermont. And if we have any quick questions or Daniel, we can just move to our next speaker. He's probably just waiting in the wings to go. Uh, well, any questions uh, for my I was curious about monoculon. Uh, our friends on the next and what material or is the name brand? Okay, did you hear the question, Mike? Yeah, I think I did. I had to do with inoculants and maybe where we stand on it. We, Because of time, we took it out. We have a whole talk on inoculants. We think any silage, any silage being made in Illinois or Vermont should have a silage inoculant on it. 
Some companies have silage specific inoculants, meaning for grasses, for alfalfa, or legumes, and for corn silages. There is some merit to that. Some of them have enzymes in them which break down some of the fiber. There's some merit in that as well. Of course, the price is always going up there as well. The Buchneri to me is a no-brainer with corn silage. And I got a feeling you don't have much high moisture corn in Vermont. You don't have the growing seasons. But if you had a some type of a snaplage or high moisture corn, the Buchneri is the, is the only way to go because it gives me some back end protection in terms of bringing those high starch feeds out of the silos and avoids the yeast formation as well. So we recommend all silages should be fermented with a product that is research driven and maybe maybe crop specific or at least has data to say it will do two things. One, reduce dry matter loss by two to three percent because it ferments faster and if it ferments faster it means you burn up less dry matter. You also have more starch and sugars in there which raises the energy content of the feedstock. The research says on corn silage, as Daniel said, anybody can make corn silage. The question is the data says there about a three to one payback. In other words, if I spend two dollars on inoculant, you will get six dollars back on additional nutrients for your beef or dairy cows. That's probably more than what you wanted to hear. There is a list, and Daniel will have access to that list starting uh, next week in, in our class. There are six or eight bacteria that we think have been proven by USDA that are effective sides inoculants, and so you should make sure you've got the right bacteria. Number two, the right number, which is 10 to the sixth uh, application, and ideally it should be put on as a liquid better coverage and make sure the liquid maybe has, especially if it gets hot in Vermont, maybe a bag of ice in the liquid unit on the chopper because if it gets hot enough, guess what happens to your bacteria? We call that cooking. We cook the bacteria. So again, make sure it's done right. So um, he, he also mentioned acid. So in a helage type situation, uh, do you have any, uh, would you differentiate? Is it six of one, half a dozen of the other or as far as Buchneri versus acid to, to get things. Uh, yeah, a great, great, I didn't hear the acid part. The acid for us really works on the drier silages. The acids, especially probe and maybe sorbic, uh, there's some sorbic acids out there as well. There's the question about acetic acids. They are mold inhibitors. They are mold inhibitors. So if the crop is going to develop mold, and usually that means that soil silages are going to be on the, on the drier end. Uh, I'm not sure you have any of those blue structures left in Illinois called harvesters, but those would be certainly candidates for that because we tend to go in a bit drier. The asses look really good on baled hay uh, when we're baling hay, and it's a bit on the on the on the wet side. Meaning uh, conventional bales somewhere's uh, around a 22% moisture. Uh, if you had regular squares, I'd be putting acid on if it got much wetter than that. The big rounds, if it's around 18, or the big hail packages, if it's more than 18% dry matter, I'd be putting the, the propionic acid on. And propionic is the key acid, and it is the most expensive acid. So look at your formulas to see how much uh, propionic and sorbic acid you're getting, because they are the mold inhibitors that work most effectively. So I would not routinely, in other words, uh, if, if the silage is wet enough, it's got bacteria and enzyme written all over it. If it's dry enough, then it's got a, it's got these acids written all over it. And uh, and if it's that dry, uh, you know, for these for these bacteria to grow, they have to have what? They have to have moisture. They have to have moisture and exclude the oxygen. So again. Uh, and, and again, where some farmers are putting these acids on is on their bunker, the last foot, the last foot of the bunker or the last uh, 10 feet in the upright silo uh, or right at the end of the bag because they know they're not going to get good sealage and compaction to occur. And so I've seen acids and, and those kinds of products put on the, 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 the surfaces. And I know there are several products on the marketplace that are designed specifically for the last two feet of the bunker silo. All right. Well, thank you, Mike, for your time. My and pleasure. Have a good one, folks. Good luck on the rest of your meeting. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Have a good one.